There was a certain amount of dissension last time, um, both during the class and afterwards, and how I was explaining Russell's main point. So what I want to do today is um, spend most of the time explaining Russell's main point um, with sufficient force and clarity to crush any dissent. And <laughs> your guys' task is to nonetheless think of an objection. Um, Okay, so Russell's main point, I think, um, is that there's a basic class of names that is getting tied up to objects, but not by being defined in terms of descriptions. Um, and if that's right, it's a really basic objection to uh, anything like um, Frege or Sell's approaches. So if there's a basic class of names that is getting hooked up to objects, but the thing is not being done by way of descriptions, then how is it being done? Well, Russell's term for that relation is acquaintance. And he means here a kind of non-propositional knowledge. That's to say, um, when you encounter an object uh, in ordinary vision, um, or a property in ordinary vision, say, then you get some knowledge of it just from the sensory encounter, just by having that connect with the thing, just by it coming into your field of view, you get some kind of knowledge of it. And that's more basic than being able to describe it. That's not a matter of being able to describe it at all. Uh, he gives some for the example of color, that when you encounter the color red, you know from experience perfectly and completely what red is. It's not that you can say, red is thus and so. It's not a matter of being able to say um, propositionally that red is thus and so. It's a matter of um, uh, knowing what it is in some more basic way. So the uh, problem with this kind of view of Russell's on which you've got the sign and the reference and nothing like Frege's sense or Searle's uh, cluster of descriptions is that, well, there were two problems. One was the problem of informativeness. You can have different signs referring to the same thing, and the identity between them can be informative. And how do you explain that possibility if it's not that names are getting hooked up to descriptions? And um, the other was the possibility of meaning without reference, because it looks like a sign can have meaning without reference. Um, so w what is going on there? How could it be that signs of meaning without reference? If they're defined in terms of descriptions, you can make sense of a description that has meaning but doesn't designate anything. But how could a sign working like this, where there's just the name and the object, how could that have meaning? These are the two key problems he's going to face. So let me um, just go over his, his main point here. There's a general contrast between what you might call how many terms and names. So for anyone who's done logic, the contrast is between quantifiers and names. But na terms that are telling you how many objects a particular predicate is true of versus names that are telling you which things the predicate is true of. So here's a predicate, wrote Waverley. One thing you can do is say how many people wrote Waverley Another thing you can do is put in a name there of someone who wrote Waverley. So if you say, someone wrote Waverley, that gives you a sentence, all right. No one wrote Waverley. Many people wrote Waverley. They all give you sentences. Um, are any of these terms names? No, these terms are not names. They are how many expressions, right? They tell you how many things wrote Waverley. That's all right. What could be plainer than that? Follow me very closely here. All kinds of radical conclusions will emerge. So if you, if you see a step that doesn't sound right, you better protest. That's all right. These are na not names. These are quantifiers uh, of how many terms. OK? So the optical illusion is when you say the author of Waverley, what that phrase, the author of Waverley is, is a complex how many term. It is not a name. So the first point you just gave me is there is a big contrast between these how many terms and names. 
Russell's point is this term, the author of Waverley, is not a name. It is a how many term. <laughs> there is an optical illusion that makes it look like a referring term, but it is not a referring term. And a simple way to see, uh, uh, here's one way of seeing Russell, Russell's, the force of Russell's point that it's not a referring term. Suppose you think very slowly. I know that for you guys this is not easy to imagine, but um, suppose that you think very slowly. And furthermore, suppose that 200 years from now, there are all kinds of novels around. Some of them are generated entirely by machines. Some of them are written by committees. Um, some of them are written by a mixture of committee and machine. Sometimes you get a novel written by just one person. Sometimes uh, you get a novel written by a, a, couple, a bunch of people and some machines. But there's also um, stylometric analyses that you can do of the novels that are written. So given a novel, you can run tests on it to say, were any humans involved in the generation of this novel? Or was this novel written by one person or by many? That's all right. You could do that. Right? So suppose you're looking at a particular novel. Uh, or suppose also you can find out the nationality of the author of a novel by uh, running the right kind of tests and what vocabulary is used, what kind of uh, sentence constructions are used. Then, okay, you're looking at Waverley and you're saying, what about this? Is this one of these entirely machine um, products? Or was a human involved in the generation of this text? Well, you can say, having run those tests, at least one person was involved in the generation of Waverley. Um, maybe machines, but certainly one human. Um, and then you run tests and say, well, was it run by a committee? Was it written by a committee? Was the text generated by a committee? And you say, no, actually, now that we run these tests, the text wasn't generated by a committee. There was at most one person involved in the writing of Waverley. And we also run the stylistic tests on the nationality of the author. And we say, well, anyone who was involved, there were no, <laughs> this is, this is a, a work of the purest Scotsness. Um, no non-Scots humans were involved in the production of this work. Anyone involved in the writing of Waverley was Scots. Okay? So you do that. Um, you come to that conclusion. Have you at this point referred to anyone? Have you named anyone so far? No. You have not named anyone so far. Have you, in contrast, used a number of how many expressions? Yes, you have used um, three. You have used at least one, at most one, and anyone who did this did that. Yep. So you used three quantified expressions, three how many expressions. No names were involved in the generation of these sentences. Right? Just how many expressions? Is that plain as day? Okay, well then we're home. For these three sentences to be true, there has to be exactly one person who wrote Waverley. But remember, you're thinking very slowly. You might not have realized that. You just walked through doing all these tests and you got these results. And if you want to state these results concisely, well, you could put it by saying the author of Waverley. You look up in your book, well, what does is, what is the author of Waverley with Scots mean? Well, it means this. It means at least one person wrote Waverley, at most one person wrote Waverley, and anyone who wrote Waverley with Scots. So using the is just a way of concisely summing up those three sentences. There's been no reference so far, so just introducing an abbreviation doesn't introduce any reference. So when you say the author of Waverley with Scots, you're just briefly expressing those three sentences. Now, as it happens, when you figure it out, you might think, well, if that's got, going to be true, at least one, at most one, and any, anyone who did this did that, then if that's true, now your thoughts speed up a little bit. And you say, yeah, look at this. There must be exactly one person who wrote Waverley. 
Now, you didn't notice that so far, but now you notice it. But it's kind of an accident that there's got to be exactly one person who wrote Waverley here. And we say, okay, let's call that person, if such a person exists, the denotation of the author of Waverley. Now then when you say the author of Waverley was Scotch, whether that's true depends on whether the predicate applies to the denotation. So you've got a situation here where you've got a kind of facsimile of reference. It looks like reference because now that you've so smartly noticed that, uh, that there is such a thing as the denotation of this expression, then you can say whether this whole thing is true depends on whether or not that denotation was Scotch. Uh, so that looks like reference, but we already agreed that there isn't really any reference here. The existence of the denotation is, how should I say, it's just a kind of accident. Because you're so smart, you whip through the three aspects of the analysis very quickly. You spot there's such a thing as a denotation, and you say, ah, that's the reference. But that is a mistake. It's a mistake you make because you think about this so fast. Um, uh, it looks like reference, but it's not, because really what we've got here are just these three sentences. And they, none of them, involve reference. So, the realization that there's such a thing as a denotation is, in a way, accidental to your understanding of the definite description. Um, Whereas, uh, if you take something that is using what seems to be a name, like Scott, and you say Scott was indeed Scotch, then uh, you couldn't understand the Scott there without knowing that it's a referring expression. In understanding that term, there aren't any three clauses to break down. There are no predicates in there. It's a simple term. It contains no moving parts. So for the sign Scott, all there is is a reference of the sign. No description here to mediate the reference. So the sign, the author of Waverley, is equivalent to, uh, or, uh, as used in the sentence, the author of Waverley was Scotch, is equivalent to those three sentences. Uh, at least one person wrote Waverley, at most one person wrote Waverley, anyone who wrote Waverley was Scotch. But that doesn't involve denotation in contrast to this kind of situation. Okay, definite descriptions do not refer. Um, uh, one, two. Um, reference is, as I'm describing it, is what happens when you have a simple sign whose meaning, who's been given meaning by having an object assigned to it as reference. Denotation is, um, it sometimes happens that you have a complex of signs here so that there's a single object on whose characteristics the truth or falsity of the whole you have a single object such that the truth or falsity of the sentence depends on whether the predicate applies to that object. Yeah? That looks like reference. But it's not reference because that assigning of the object, that, that object was not assigned to any term there as its semantic value. That object, yeah, that's the best way to put it. That object is not the semantic value of any term in this analysis. These terms all have quite different kinds of semantic values. They're all either predicates or um, how many terms. I mean, where is, sorry, yeah, where is the object? Where is the sign in this, these three sentences that has an object as its semantic value? There is no sign in there that has an object as its semantic value. Yeah? Sorry? Yes, that's, not, that's completely irrelevant. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. But you see what I mean? So wh whereas with Scott, uh, where is it, Scott with Scotch, then the only way you have of saying what the semantic value of Scott here is, is by saying which object is its semantic value. Yeah. So it, and when the object, has, when the sign has the object as its semantic value, what that comes to is that uh, when you've got sentence like that, the truth or falsity of the sentence will depend on whether the predicate applies to that object. Yeah. That, 
Denotation is quite like that. Yeah? Uh, that's why it's so natural to think these are referring signs. Um, you know, Frege and Searle were not just being random about this. It's very like reference, but it is not reference because there's no sign there that has that object as a semantic value. Yeah? I'll put it just one last way. Um, you could th when you see that uh, you can define the denotation and say the truth or falsity of this sentence will depend on, the de uh, uh, on how things are with that object, it's natural to think, well, there must be some sign there that has that object as its semantic value. I say, I bet it's the description. But when you, it's when you think, well, what are all these complex words? What, 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 what are all these different words doing in the description? You see, well, the description doesn't have that object as its semantic value as an unstructured block, the way a name does. Yeah? So you've got to break down the description and look at what the semantic values of the components are. And when you do that, the illusion that you have reference here disappears because you see that none of the signs have that object as their semantic value. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, that's right. But it seems like when we have the predicate, we could put in a quantifier, but we also could put in a name. When we have predicates, we could put in a quantifier, but we also could put in a name. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So you're making the claim that they're not, uh, that they're only quantified predicates and not names at all. In the case of definite descriptions, there are only uh, quantifiers over predicates and not names. I mean, there might be special cases. I mean, in this case, there is a name in there. But as I said earlier, that's, that, that's accidental. That, that, that's not to the point. Um, uh, putting in the description is just putting in a bunch of quantifiers. Right. Putting in the the is just putting in a quantifier. The is a quantifier term. All is a quantifier term. Um, uh, some is a quantifier term. The is a quantifier term. So is he just, just defining it as a quantifier term? Like, I, I don't understand. Like, you could put in either a quantifying term or a name in the case of the subject place of the predicate. So I don't know <coughs> where he's getting this point that it has to be just a series of quantifiers. Well, you can put in a name in the sense that you could write in Scott. Yeah? And that's putting a name into the predicate. Yeah. So it's not that you can only, uh, indeed he's saying, it must, uh, he, uh, as we'll see in a moment, he's saying there must be some cases where you put in a name. Yeah. Uh, so it's not that you're only ever allowed to put in quantifiers. It's rather that when you put in a the phrase, you are thereby only putting in a quantifier. Um, and the argument is these the phrases are complex. I mean, you understand them by understanding the meanings of the individual words that are in the the phrase. In order to understand the author of Waverley, you had to understand author of and Waverley. Yeah. Um, and so you need to be able to explain how from the semantic values of these terms, the semantic value of the whole phrase is being generated. That's what this analysis does. It explains how from uh, the components, wrote Waverley and um, Scott and was Scotch, you, you are generating the meaning of the the term. So if you really wanted to challenge Russell here, you'd have to say, you, I think any, or anything is possible, but I think anyone would have to agree that the meaning of a descriptive phrase is complex. How about that? Do we all buy that? It depends on the meanings of the words. There are lots of individual words there, and the meaning of the whole thing depends on the meanings of those words. And um, you'd have to explain what the semantic value of the whole thing is in terms of the meanings of the components um, in such a way that the whole thing was being assumed to be assigned a, sing a, a, a reference as its semantic value. That's not what happens here. Yeah. 
So you'd need to, if you really wanted to challenge yourself, I think that's what you'd have to do. Yeah, Frege d didn't really, I mean, Frege founded the subject, so it's not at all that I wish to be disrespectful about Frege's errors, right? Um, but um, uh, Frege did not ask the question, how is the semantic value of a definite description generated from the semantic values of its components? Frege did not really seem to get, did not seem to focus on the question, how do the semantic values of the words produce the semantic value of the whole thing? He just didn't ask that question. He just seems to have taken it for, that, that's, this is my reading at any rate, he just seems to have taken it for granted that um, when you get the whole description, you get the thing it stands for. And that, that's what I mean about your mind working too fast. You know, it's true there is such a thing as a denotation, but when you freeze frame over that, and say, now how come there is such a thing as the denotation? What are those individual, what are those, all those little words doing in there? And that's when you see the force of Russell's point. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, th th there's room for choice here. I I I'm distinguishing reference and denotation. I should say, incidentally, that um, Kripke, who we'll be looking at next, talks about denotation and reference the whole time, and he's not distinguishing between them. So um, th th this is for the purposes of this lecture only, if you see what I mean. It's not that that distinction is used. That's not the way that the, the terms aren't used in the, dis in the literature generally with that kind of distinction. Okay, but l l so l that's just an aside. Um, but uh, you, you could do it two ways. You could say, um, I, I said there's such a thing as a denotation in the case of a description. Uh, a person such that um, uh, the truth or falsity of the whole thing depends on how things are with that person. You could say in general, if, there's such, if that you get that phenomenon, you've got denotation. And then that would apply to names too. Uh, all I'm doing here is trying to bring out the parallels and contrasts between what a description does and what a, a name does. Uh, how you go on, I... Uh, uh, Suppose there are two Scots and they're both famous. Okay, okay. The, uh, uh, and are they identical? Yeah. There's still going to be an argument. I mean, this is what I meant by, I, I began by reminding the argument. I mean, Frege and Searle were not getting their views out of nowhere. Um, uh, there is still going to be an argument about what's going on with informative identities, then. How come there can be meaning without reference? And that's, I think, with a really deep, interesting pressure. So bear with me if you think this is a merely technical question. Um, we, we'll see very shortly that it's not. Um, but these arguments are still there and they still have to be addressed. And they're obviously not addressed by, um, where's it gone, um, this kind of picture. Because, uh, yeah, we, we, this is where we began, that this seems inadequate because of the possibility of informative identities and meaning without reference. Um, so now we've been driven back to it because what we had in the middle was descriptions. And now I'm saying you, it's actually a mistake to try and put descriptions in the middle there. But now we, that original problem just returns with full force. Yep. Yep. This or that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, you're also adding, 
Uh, I agree it can work like that. Um, um, I mean, it can, you can point to something and use your finger to point to it. Um, and I can point to uh, someone and say, oh, that tall man, and he's not actually tall, but it doesn't matter. I did, I did the whole flourish, including the words, in such a way that you got locked on to the right thing. Yeah. And the words there were just gas to help you look at the right thing. You, you see what I mean? Um, so there, this kind of analysis doesn't really seem appropriate at all. Because if I'm saying um, the tall man is talking, that tall man is talking, um, then I'm just using the words as a way of getting you to look at the right person. And the, the, it's as if I pulled you in front of the person and waggled the person at you while <laughs> forcing your head to look at him, if you see what I mean. But um, in polite society, we don't do it just like that. You know, when <laughs> once you're over about two years old, we don't do it like that anymore. Um, if then. Um, uh, so I, I just do some talking to get you to lock on to the right thing. But the content of the talking isn't important. Right? That can happen. I, I agree that can happen. And you say, well, it doesn't matter that he's tall. I, I, I meant him. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but what I'm talking about, what we're talking about here is when you take the terms literally, you take them as saying exactly what they, uh, how should I say, canonically mean. Yeah. Okay. Because so far as that kind of thing goes, you could, I mean, any word might do. You know, if I, I could say boo boo boo, you know, but, uh, and, and that would work to get you to look at the right person. Okay, last one, we should move on. Yeah. Um, if, the, if the definite description has a semantic value in and of itself, or if, if, if you want to think that it doesn't have that? That's right, it doesn't have a semantic value in and of itself, yeah. Um, then how does it explain the fact that like, if I just say the author of Waverly like, by itself, not in the context of the other words and sentence, that I can still understand um, the demotation, that it's still like present? It's not like I need to say the whole sentence in order for it to actually like refer or be. Uh, well, you can know what the denotation would be if the thing were put into a whole sentence. Yeah. But there's a ge very general point here that we, there's, there's no such thing really as understanding words outside the context of a sentence. Yeah. I mean, if I just say, well, look, I mean, suppose I say, look, li listen up, class, this laptop, this cup, and this remote. Well, <laughs> what happened? Nothing, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I just gave you a list of words. Yeah. A uh, uh, in order to um, make a move in language, in order to do something that makes some sense, you've got to utter a whole sentence. So all these notions of reference or denotation have to keep being tied back to the truth or falsity of sentences. I mean, if I just say to you right now, the king of France, well... What of it? <laughs> right. I mean, what do you want to say about him? That's the question. Yeah, I haven't actually said anything yet. So we, uh, there's some sense in which you can know the denotation, but that's just, well, let me fill it out. Uh, I, I would, would know what the denotation was. Yeah. Uh, I said last one, but, but there was another one. Okay. I, I, I really think we should move on, if that's okay. Because yeah. we're not going to go very far from this point for a, for a while. Um, Okay, so I've been mean, arguing you need uh, to, you, that you should think, think of um, the expressions, that you should think of the as a quantifier, think of the as a how many term. And now the thing is, um, suppose you consider how you explain the meaning of a general term. Suppose you've got a child. Um, or s s someone intelligent who understands English but who just doesn't yet know what the meaning of the term is tall is, how do you explain it? I mean, in general, you don't explain the meaning. Sometimes you can explain the meanings of terms by definitions, but that's not uh, always or even usually how you explain the meaning of a general term. So if um, I'm right here and you're right before me and I'm saying to you, well, what does that mean, is tall? I keep using it as an example, but I, I, I actually have no idea what it means. Um, then how would you explain the meaning? Well, one thing you could do is to say, well, look at the room. Someone is tall. Or you might say, look, look at this room. No, none of them are tall. 
Many people are tall. None of that is going to help. You can't, in general, explain the meaning of a general term by putting quantified expressions in. If you want to explain the meaning of a general term, and if you want to explain what red means, you can't do it by saying, oh, well, there are lots of red things. You've got to get down to specifics and say something about which things are red and which things aren't. The way you explain what, what red and what green mean is by saying, look, this one's red, this one's green, this one's red, this one's green, that one's not red, that one's not green, this one's red, this one's green. Right? You take lots of examples. That's how you explain the meaning of a general term. So with this tall, you might go around the class and say, look, there's Tom, Tom's tall, Sally's tall, Hanyo's tall. This one's tall, that one's tall, that one's not tall. You see what I mean? Um, you could only explain the meaning of a general term by putting names into the slot and giving examples using the names. Keep running the, the names through the uh, uh, slot in the expression. So if you're going to explain the meaning of a general term, you need names. I don't mean to be saying anything very controversial here. I hope this is sounding like common sense. Uh, yeah. That's right. You, you, you could do that by saying, let's, let's, suppose you're trying to explain to me what red means, right? And you take um, some set theoretic description of the class, yeah? And you say, well, if you take the union of these two sets in, and the intersection of that with this set, yeah, and eventually narrow it down to one, yeah? Um, that's red. Yep. So, so, so someone's wearing red. Yep. Now that might be true, that might be true, but the thing is that's not going to help me until I say, oh yeah, there's exactly one thing meeting all those conditions and that's red. I don't know yet until I can say, oh, and it's, if you don't mind me pointing, it's that one, right? You, you, you see? Uh, uh, once I got the, I the that, the, the, then I'm in business. Um, and I might have done the set theoretic thing to clue me in. But the set theoretic thing on its own wouldn't help me. Yep. Uh, sorry, there was someone else. What, was that you? Yeah. I'm sorry, can you do that louder? Please? Yes. It's not a name. I agree it's not a name. Um, uh, oh, oh, uh -huh. It has, it is like a name in that it has its semantic value by standing for an object. It's a little bit fancy because it does have that person in there. And you may say, wait a minute, that's a general term. What is that doing there? Yeah, we should be perfectly reasonable. So um, the only thing is that we don't usually describe it, regard it as courteous to describe um, people as that, if you see what I mean. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, well, he you can only use for people, if you see what I mean. Um, but. Uh, to set aside courtesy in favour of purity. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Oh. That is tall, okay? As John McCain would say, that one is tall. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, l last one. Uh, Yeah, that's how, you show, so that's how you tell someone what is tall means. You see a whole bunch of people and you say, look, that was tall, that was tall, that was tall, that was not tall. Does it also explain why it's tall? No, I mean, that has to do with feeding and genetics and, um, I suppose. <laughs> it doesn't explain how you come to be tall. Yeah. What is the good, yes. That's right. Um, uh, well, uh, if you take that example, uh, explaining what the good is, yeah, uh, that's, that's, a oh, that's a very special case. Yeah? But 
uh, 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 but one view of it would be, it's like color words. You can say this is red and that's red and that's red and that's red and that's not red, that's not red, that's not red. Um, and when you do that, you've done all you can to explain the color word. And if someone says, yes, but in addition, what makes something red? Well, there isn't really anything you can say there. You could talk about the physics or something, but th 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 that's not what makes it red. Um, um, except in the sense that th th that's how you can construct something red. Um, uh, and similarly with good, there might not be anything general to say about what makes something good. If there is something general to say about what makes something good, um, like, you know, it pleases the king or uh, something, then, um, yeah, it makes mom happy. <laughs> right? you, you might say, well, there is a jive, I have a general theory of what goodness is. That's fine, but that's in addition here. That's a quite special feature of this case. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so to explain general terms, you need names. You can't explain general terms with how many expressions. So, if we take it for granted, then, that the meaning of a general term like wa wrote Waverley is explained by its use in sentences involving names, then um, we've got to understand how that uh, uh, explanation of wrote Waverley connects with other uses of the term. So what you do is, you first of all explain the meaning of red in the context, this is red, that's red, that's red, that's red. And then... Uh, uh, you go to explain, well, how does that relate to uh, someone wrote Waverley? Because anyone might say, look, you just explained the meaning of um, read or wrote Waverley in the context of sentences with names in them. But now you're going to say, someone wrote Waverley. And I'm aghast. You know, you didn't, you didn't, say, you didn't say anything about that. You, you see what I mean? If you explain read to me, by saying, look, this one's red, this one's red, that one's not red, that one's not red, this one's red. Then, all right, now I, uh, uh, and I get that, and I say, now you've explained the meaning of red as it occurs in sentences with names in them. But then you say, something is red, and I'm completely thrown. I don't know, what does that mean? I need a whole new explanation here. Well, the natural way to connect them if you're going to say, well, how do I explain the relation of these how many sentences to the sentences of names? Um, what I was suggesting last time was you can read, the, the, you can read someone wrote Waverley as meaning there is at least one potential name. You could introduce a name, A, and then put in A wrote Waverley, and that comes out true. So if you explain is read to me by saying this one's red, that one's red, that one's red, that one's red, um, and then I, go, I say, okay, I know what um, red means. And now you say something is red. Well, my way of interpreting that is to say that means there's at least one name that that I could put in the red slot and it would come out true. That's how I connect the how many term to the use of the names. On the other hand, if you say no one wrote Waverley, all you're saying is there's no potential name such that uh, a, a such that A wrote Waverley is true. Or if you say many people wrote Waverley, what you're saying is there are many potential names, A1 and A2, such that A1 wrote Waverley, A2 wrote Waverley, and so on. So this is a picture on which names belong to the ground floor of language. And... Uh, and uh, uh, names are more basic than how many or quantifier terms. Quantifier terms are explained in terms of names. In order to explain general terms, you've got to have a rack of names. So how many terms come in at a much higher level of language use than either na names or general terms? So if we've got... Um, if we've got how many terms? Uh, we've got names and we've got general terms. Then explaining how these work, the how many terms the, uh, in particular, is relatively straightforward um, once we have Russell's analysis. But the real hard thing is how we explain what's going on at this more basic level 
Um, and now we, don't, we can't appeal to descriptions in explaining what's going on at this more basic level. So that leads us to Russell's conclusion. There's a basic class of names that gets tied up to objects, but not by being defined in terms of descriptions. So at this point, um, I, I think that completes the case for throwing out um, uh, Frege and Sell on descriptions. How about that? <laughs> Are there any remaining embers of dissent? Uh huh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the spirit. Yes. Right. <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> right. Well, when you say descriptions are the more basic case, the denotation of a take the denotation of a description to be the more basic case. Um, the, the two questions for you are, um, are you taking descriptions to be complex or simple? If you, if you say, I'm going to treat descriptions as, as if they're simple and explain their meaning just by hooking them up to a denotation, yeah, then that's just treating descriptions as names. Yeah, and th th that's not really any different to Russell's theory. Because there you're saying, although it looks like you've got familiar words in the description, they're not really doing any work. On the other hand, that, so that, that's not an alternative to Russell. The, 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 that's treating descriptions as names. Um, on the other hand, if you say, no, descriptions are, descriptions are complex, and those individual words in them are doing significant work. Well, if you accept Russell's explanation of what all those terms in them are doing, um, then the denotation of the expression is not basic. Um, the, denota the expression has a denotation only because these general terms have already been explained and understood. Yeah. But for those general terms to be already explained and understood, they had to have been coupled up with names. Yeah. That was the argument I was just giving. Yeah. Okay, and so we move gloriously on. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, just one last, this is just one last kind of sentence, slight, slightly technical. There's a notion of witnessing that is kind of helpful to have sometimes. Suppose you say someone is F, then that can't be the end of, of, of the story if you say someone is F. Um, there's got to be some, you, it's got to be possible to name the thing that is F. Right? It's good. You, you can say, give it a name. So, um, uh, 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 logicians call that witnessing the statement someone is F. You witness it by say, giving a name. A is F. Give it a name. Um, and similarly, if you say there's exactly one X which is F and any Y that is F is also G, then you can say, oh, what's its name? You can ask for it to be witnessed. You can say, namely. So since you can say namely with a definite descriptor, uh, w w with a the <laughs> sentence, um, uh, there's always got to be that lower level. When you say the F is G, you can say, well, and which one is that, the F, and be able to name it somehow. Um, so that's just, how should I say, rounding out the point that um, there's a class of names that's more basic than descriptions. So if there's a class of names that's more basic than descriptions, um, and they're hooked up to the world somehow, what does that look like? Well, we have these problems of informativeness and meaning without reference, and they're not going away. So how are we going to address them here? Russell says, so long as names are used as names, then Scott is Sir Walter is the same trivial proposition as Scott is Scott. So that's a really radical claim. He's saying with real names, true names, you cannot have uninformative identities. Sorry. You cannot have informative identities. <laughs> okay. Let me take that from the top. So 
it little, you might think this is Scottish Sir Walter could be informative, but if they're really being used as names, then Scottish Sir Walter is trivial. It's always uninformative when you've got names. And he turns it on his head. Take the idea that there can be meaning without reference. You can inquire significantly whether Homer existed, but you couldn't do that if Homer were a name. Because if Homer's a name, if something's a name, then it has its meaning just by standing for the object. It's like that example of smudge I was giving, where the name has meaning just by standing for its object. So you can't meaningfully inquire whether the name stands for anything. That would make no sense. Um, so since you can meaningfully inquire whether Homer existed, Homer can't be a name. It must be just some kind of descriptive phrase. Really, in ordinary language, no names occur. Names in the sense of this ground floor level of language, what look like names aren't really names. No names in the strict sense of car, but what seem like names are really descriptions. With the exception, and these are the, these are the true proper names, this or that, and a few other words, of which the meaning varies on different occasions. So what he's got in mind here is, um, suppose you take a term for a current sensation you're having, like a headache. Suppose you say, this headache. Um, could that term have meaning even though there was no headache? Well, it's characteristic of your own sensations that um, uh, if you think they're there, then they've got to be there. You can't be wrong about that. Homer out there in the concrete world, might, it might for all the world appear as if there's such a thing, but the thing not be there. In the case of your own inner life, if it appears as if the thing is there, then it's there. That's what your inner life is. That totality of ways things appear to you. And think about it with informative identities. I said an informative identity is when you can have two different takes on one and the same object. Now that makes perfect sense for a three-dimensional concrete object in the physical world. So you can have the table from this angle or the table from that angle. But suppose you take this headache and I say, well, okay, I've got a pain in my foot too, or I've got an itch in my foot. Is that itch this headache? Well, in your inner life, these things are completely obvious. There is no such thing as being able to formulate an informative identity about your own inner life. Um, so uh, if the problem of informative identities does not arise if the most basic class of names here is really a set of signs referring to your own sensations or your own sense data. When you ask, is this sensation of redness the same as, the same as this headache? That's always, if it's true, it would be trivial. If it seems like a, a, an exciting possibility, then it's not true. Properly speaking, names refer only to your own current or recent sense data. And it's your acquaintance with those sensations, Russell says, that fixes their reference. But look at the implication of this. When you or I, uh, and you're just driven to this by these problems about informativeness, meaning without reference, and the analysis of descriptions, there is nowhere else to go at this point. Um, but we are driven to the idea that each of us is interpreting the whole of our language in terms of their own sensations. You can never refer to my sensations. I can never refer to your sensations. There is really a strong sense in which communication between us is impossible because you are ultimately interpreting everything you say in terms of your own inner, inner life. And I am ultimately interpreting everything I say in terms of my inner life. There's a very revealing, um, uh, Russell gave some lectures on logical atomism in um, when, 19 oh, 1912, something like that. Um, it, question, if the proper name of a thing, a this referring to a sense datum, varies from instant to instant, how is it possible to make any argument? I mean, your own inner life is shifting from moment to moment. And Russell says, well, you can keep the, this going for a minute or two. I made that dot, you know, a, a mark on the board. I made that dot and talked about it for some little time. I mean, it varies often. If you argue quickly, you can get some little way before it's finished. 
I think things last for a finite time, or some sec a matter of some seconds or minutes or whatever it may happen to be. Question, you do not think the air is acting on that and changing it? R Mr. Russell, it does not matter about that if it does not alter its appearance enough for you to have a different sense datum. So the key thing in your understanding of your own use of language is the sense datum. And it's only such stability as that has over time that your meanings of your language have over time. And it's only uh, in some very extended sense that we can ever be said to understand each other. Okay, sorry, I went over time, but thank you for bearing with me.